This presentation is intended to give a very brief account of uh, the first 50 years of the Society for Libyan Studies. Clearly a great deal has taken place, has been done during that period, so it will be extremely selective. But to start with, uh, I show various motifs which have appeared on the cover of the Society's journal over the years. Emphasising, first of all, from 1981, a specific wish to look Libyan and relevant to Libyan as well as European scholars. Then choosing in 1987, an image of an indigenous people on the fringes of the Roman world at Gerza. This was followed in 1994 on the cover of a volume dedicated specifically to Cyrenaica by a gemstone showing the nymph Cyrene tackling a lion. And in 2003, the society adopted a motif taken from native Libyan rock art, the simpler outlines of which provide the logo which it still uses today. But let me go back to the origins of the society in 1969, predating by three months the military coup which brought Muammar al-Gaddafi to power. The motivation was primarily archaeological. During the years of Italian colonial rule, scholars of no other nationality had access to the evidently rich archaeology of the country. In 1943, with the Allied victory, that suddenly changed and it all fell in practice into British hands. The British began to involve Libyans in their own heritage, something the Italians had definitely not done, and the relationship persisted after independence in 1951, most particularly with Richard Goodchild serving as controller of antiquities for Cyrenaica in 1953 to 66. Two years after leaving Libya and having just taken up a professorship in London, Goodchild died of cancer at the age of 50. In the first annual report of the society, it was written that for a number of years it had been felt both in Libya and in Britain, that there should be a properly constituted centre for Libyan studies, either here or there. The death of Professor Goodchild and the desirability of completing his unfinished archaeological projects brought a fresh urgency to this. And on the initiative of the British Academy, the society was brought into being. There were various strands to this. There were the precedents of the other British schools of archaeology abroad, as in Rome, Athens and Ankara, but the initial choice of Libya Exploration Society as the name for the new institution suggests echoes of the Egypt Exploration Society, a membership organisation which sponsored archaeological work in Egypt. Happily, this name was abandoned as too close to the already extant Petroleum Exploration Society of Libya, but it may also have been considered too colonial in its implication of exploring an unknown country. The first president of the society was Sir Duncan Cumming, who had served with distinction as a civil administrator in Cyrenaica and other ex-Italian territories during and immediately after the Second World War. The chairman was Professor Donald Strong, seen on the right here, who had succeeded to Goodchild's chair in London and who also died tragically young in 1973. And the honorary secretary, portrayed in the middle photograph, was Olwyn Brogan, an intrepid explorer of the Tripolitanian pre-desert. Lady Brogan was assisted by an assistant secretary, Mary Ann Mauer, Later, later Mrs. Fishbourne. While the immediate impetus was clearly archaeological, it was written into the rules of the society from the beginning that it was to advance, encourage and support and undertake the study of and re research relating to history, antiquities, culture, languages, literature, art, institutions, customs and natural history of Libya and any other matters related thereto. While the society has members who pay a subscription and in return received its journal and are invited to lectures, 
Its principal activity has been to receive funding regularly from the British government through the British Academy and occasionally from elsewhere and it then disperses these funds in research grants or applies them to projects of which it claims ownership or to which it lends its name in a formal sense. These society projects have been essentially archaeological involving larger or smaller teams of people. It's beyond the scope of this very brief presentation to do more than allude to the host of grants through which the society has promoted other fields of study. Suffice it to say that these have included geology, geography, ethnography, history of all periods, natural history, law, literature, education, music, and even contemporary issues such as migration. A brief resume of the Society's archaeological projects may be seen here in tabular form, showing the years in which substantial sums were spent on each and, in the red spots, the points at which definitive reports arising from them have appeared in print. Behind these must be understood the changing environment in which they have taken place. In the first place, the political environment within Libya and it, in its international relations have obviously had a big influence. For no field work was possible in the years 1983 to 88, years in which PC Yvonne Fletcher was shot outside the Libyan People's Bureau in London, and the US actually dropped bombs on Tripoli. Another difficulty was created by the Lockerbie bombing and the UN sanctions that followed. During much of the 1990s, Libya could only be accessed by land from Egypt or Tunisia. But this did not wholly prevent the society from carrying out research in Libya at the end of the 20th century, thus sustaining cultural contacts and fostering the goodwill upon which relationships between peoples as opposed to their leaders, depends. The academic environment also has evolved. The first of the big projects here uh, is the work in the Fazan, initially at Germa and then more widely. This was started by Charles Daniels in 1958 before the society existed and it was later renewed and extended over a long period by David Mattingly, resulting in a fine series of publications. Alongside this, at the beginning of the society's time, there arose at Benghazi an archaeological emergency, where the redevelopment by the municipality of a 19th century cemetery at Sidi Krebish threatened the last open space on the edge of the Hellenistic and Roman city of Berenike. The local Department of Antiquities asked for British assistance and between them Professor Donald Strong in London and Professor Barry Jones in Manchester mobilised a body of young people from amongst their students and contacts to supervise the excavation which then took place uh, and which you see here uh, in a photograph taken from a plane coming into land uh, at the airport of Benghazi. And later on, uh, the uh, same people conducted the study and publication of the finds. After nearly a year of continuous excavation, the society engaged one of these students, John Lloyd, then aged 24, to coordinate and direct the project. The series of publications which has followed has put Berenike prominently on every map of the Mediterranean world in Hellenistic and Roman times. The next major field project originated, perhaps surprisingly, with Colonel Gaddafi himself. He had little time for archaeology or history of any kind, but he was interested in what past settlement patterns could tell us about potential land use today. As a result, the Department of Antiquities was given funds which provided, through the medium of UNESCO, support 
for a British survey project in Tripolitania, a French team operating in the Sertica, and for the Italians to conduct field survey in Saranaica. The Italian survey never took place and the French one was of brief duration and limited scope. But the British produced a triumphant and definitive two volume report on the UNESCO Libyan Valleys Archaeological Survey in 1966. Uh, this showed how Roman settlement uh, in the peripheral, peripheral pre-desert zone did not depend on significant differences in climate from the present day, but depended on the careful uh, retention and use of the rainfall that did fall there to bring areas into cultivation, which until recently had been uh, allowed to revert to uh, an uncultivated pre-desert state. The next major field project, the rich, um, the, sorry, the Berenike rescue excavation had been funded from a variety of sources and it's worthy of note that at this time it was the society which solicited the funds and received the grants. Much the same applies to the 1980s in which the society promoted work uh, when it couldn't excavate on the unpublished excavations at Sabratha carried out by Kathleen Kenyon and John Ward Perkins in the years immediately after the Second World War, and the architectural study by the latter of the Severan buildings at Leptis Magna. And this resulted in further publications, which you see here. In subsequent years, however, the Society has rarely initiated projects in quite the same way. Sometimes the Department of Antiquities has suggested certain lines of research, but it's more typical now that British scholars in university posts have directed projects of their choosing with the encouragement and support of the society. But where these have obtained additional funding from other sources, those funds have been sought by the principal investigators, as they are now called, and have not passed through the society's books. The Saranaica Prehistory Project, directed by Professor Graham Barker, which you see towards the bottom of this chart, and the various Fazan projects directed by Professor David Mattingly, have been notable examples of society projects which have attracted substantial funding from the European Research Council through its grants mechanism. The geographical world in which these projects have been carried out has also changed out of all recognition during the 50 years of the society's history. In the early years, there were only unreliable, small-scale maps originating in Italian colonial surveys. And then in the 1950s, the Americans had made a more accurate, but still fairly approximate aerial survey of the country. Uh, of which you see a sheet here. The, uh, go, the, the red oval uh, marks the uh, Mizda area of the Tripolitanian pre-desert. When the Libyan Valleys Survey set about their work under the direction of Barry Jones and Graham Barker, they still had to rely on these maps to determine where they were on the ground. The recording of individual sites from the air was, however, massively facilitated by the novel use of a radio controlled camera attached to a kite. But it's in the 1981 issue of the journal that first mention appears of the use of satellite imagery, in this instance, for estimating water usage. We are now fully accustomed to the remarkable potential of Google Earth and other readily accessible satellite imagery for the identification and interpretation of archaeological sites. And we can instantly locate our own position in the field by means of mobile phones or other GPS devices. Likewise, kites and balloons have been superseded by inexpensive drone photography. 
I shall close this review with just two further observations. The first is of a financial nature. You see here uh, a graph which shows the society's evolving so uh, sources of funds over the past 50 years. The red line shows subscription income, the green one the core grant received from the British Academy and the blue line along the bottom shows other one-off grants sometimes also from the Academy uh, and then the mauve line along the top shows the to total of these various sources of income. Despite the political ups and downs, the money available to the society for its activities has grown progressively over the years until the financial upheaval uh, of 2008. At that point, the British, British Academy was actively encouraging us to set up a permanent office in Tripoli, supported by an increased core grant. But this objective was quickly abandoned after the crash uh, in that year. And since then, the Academy, under pressure from the government, has sought systematically to reduce its support. However, the picture is not quite as simple as that, for there has been a good deal of inflation over the long time span shown here. You see now added to this chart an additional blue line, and that represents the total of our income adjusted according to changes in the retail price index for inflation over the period. It shows a somewhat choppier progress with a distinctive low point in 1983, but rather unexpectedly, it shows that the society's efforts to obtain funds for the Sidi Krabish excavation in its earliest years, more or less on a day-to-day -day basis, succeeded on a comparable scale to anything it has done more recently. The second observation is that while the British Academy is today insistent that the money it gives us is to be spent to promote the UK research endeavour, the rules of the society have always embraced a less restrictive remit to encourage, support and undertake the study and research into a wide range of fields. The society has therefore always been and still is deeply committed to including the training of Libyans uh, in its activities. At various times it has provided scholarships for Libyans to come to the UK for study and since the revolution of 2011 it has sought in difficult circumstances to provide training in Libya or uh, in Libya which uh, both Libyans and British can reach at the present time, training to Libyans which will enhance their ability to record uh, and preserve their historic heritage. It has also fostered the production of guidebooks to educate and promote understanding of Libya's rich cultural heritage, uh, both uh, abroad and within Libya itself. The volumes so far published on Tripolitania and Cyrenaica have been produced in both English and Arabic language editions and with the support of various sponsors, both public and private, uh, considerable quantities of these Arabic editions uh, have been gifted to the Libyan people for free distribution to universities, schools and public administration bodies concerned with planning and development and the like. I hope that uh, in another 50 years the Society for Libyan Studies will be able to look back with equal pride on a further range uh, of positive activities and achievements.